Welcome everyone, those of you who are joining us for tonight's virtual parlor chat. We will begin momentarily. Oops, so far, so good on this poll. So those of you, thank you for um, starting to respond to our poll of the evening. Just getting a sense of who in the audience has submitted their 2020 census yet. Don't worry, it is anonymous, so we won't know. Now, Sarah, I assume that you probably got your census done right away. <laughs> Yep, I, I just checked it off the list. I did it and it took me about three minutes. So it was really quick, <laughs> really was, quick. Um, we yeah, we did it online. Um, my husband and I and, and because as everyone will soon find out, I'm a bit of a census history nerd. I was a little disappointed that it was so short. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably like the only person who felt like that. So, Meg, should we begin? Let's give it a couple more minutes. Just okay. So all of uh, our attendees can filter in. Sounds good. Everyone gets the get the chance to take the poll. Mm -hmm. We're gonna leave the poll up for the first five minutes or so. So I refer back to it. All right. Okay, when you give me the thumbs up, that's when I will start. One more minute. Okay. Welcome to those of you who may be joining us on live stream via Facebook and welcome to all of our Zoom registrants. Okay. All right. Good evening and welcome everyone to tonight's virtual parlor chat, why the census matters past and present. My name is Megan Burns and I'm the programs manager at Morris Jumel Mansion, which is a historic house in New York City. In our new informal parlor chat series, which are scheduled to take place on the third Wednesday of each month at 7 p.m., we take an informal look at the house's history with experts and make conversation and connections to the present day. So just a brief overview of tonight's program. 
and um, some of your Zoom audience options before I introduce our guest panelist. So tonight's program will consist of approximately 35 to 40 minutes of discussion between myself and our guest panelist, Sarah. We're going to talk a little bit about the census. Sarah's going to go over some of the present day census. I'm going to focus on the past. And uh, we're going to pause periodically to take questions from the audience. And then the last 10 to 15 minutes of our program will be opened at the end for additional Q&A. So, okay, so I see some of you are still, please keep continuing to respond to the poll. Um, so just to go over a little bit of our Zoom protocols, tonight's presentation is being live streamed and recorded. Um, so since those of you who are joining us via Zoom webinar, all of you will be automatically muted with no video so far. However, because we are recording, know that if you choose to remain in the meeting, if you choose to comment in the chat box, raise your hands virtually and are called upon to speak by either Sarah or myself, you are giving your consent to be recorded. Um, and if you also wish to speak, just know that we can call on you, but you'll need to unmute yourself um, in order for the audio to work. Hold on. There we are. Um, and this is just an overview of the um, basic navigation tools that are available to you in the audience. You can see at the very top, you can change your viewing options, how you choose to see the PowerPoints, um, some of us who are presenting. In the lower left, there are also ways to adjust your audio settings to your preference. And then the main way to communicate with us and tonight's moderators, uh, Shiloh and Meg from Morris Jumel Mansion, will be via the chat box, via the virtually raised hand, and in the, the question and answer box. So, with that said, um, I want to set the stage for tonight's discussion about the census. Uh, for those of you who haven't had the opportunity to visit us yet on site at Morris Jumel Mansion, um, here is an image of it. It is a 256 year old house, which amazingly still exists in its original uh, site or location in Washington Heights. And it actually predates the country itself. It was built in 1765 before the American Revolution. So it has a lot of interesting history, lots of interesting people connected with it, um, including uh, the first president, George Washington. Um, he spent some time at the mansion. And as Sarah will get into in a moment, he also has a very strong connection with the census. So hence the reason why we're hosting this. And we're also hosting it because it's a really important thing to do, uh, particularly um, to ensure political representation, funding, all those things that Sarah is about to talk about. So without further ado, I, I'm going to introduce um, tonight's panelist. So with me tonight to explore the topic of why the census matters is Sarah Malaika. Sarah is a partnership specialist with the US Census Bureau. She comes to public service after over a decade in the museum and nonprofit sector, managing education programs, artist projects, and international museum partnerships. Since 2018, she has worked conducting 2020 census outreach to communities around New York City to ensure that everyone knows that the census is safe, easy, and important to participate. So please join me in welcoming Sarah to our, pa our panel tonight. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to virtually be here with you all. <laughs> this evening um, to talk about all things census, um, past and present. Um, so thanks so much for that great introduction. Um, it's so fun to be able to do a program um, with you um, because the mansion is so intertwined with um, our history. 
um, both our city and our country's history. So it's really great to be here with you. Um, so um, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about um, the 2020 census this evening. Um, I'm with the U.S. Census Bureau, which is a, a federal agency, and uh, we are the largest statistical agency in the U.S. So um, we do a lot of surveys. We have over 130 programs and surveys. So for those of you out there who think, um, I think somebody in the chat also mentioned that they think the census is too short. Well, uh, we have a whole bunch of other surveys that are much longer. Um, so you're welcome to check it out on our, on our um, webpage to see some of the other information that we gather. So without further ado, um, the aim of the 2020 census is to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. Um, and when I say in the right place, I mean where people live, right? So it doesn't matter where you're from or it doesn't matter where, you know, which neighborhood you work in, you get counted where you live. Um, we do the census um, because it's mandated by Article 1, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution. And, you know, basically it's the second paragraph of the Constitution. That's how important the census was to the people who founded our country because they were trying to have a representative government. And in order to have that representative government, you know, we need to know where the people were and how many people there were in each state and in every region. Um, so we have been doing this census every 10 years since 1790. And we do it because it affects our representation in government as well as our funding. Um, and I'll go into details um, a little bit um, in the next couple slides about our representation and funding. Um, the thing that I want you to remember from today is that the census is safe, easy, and important. So I'm gonna go th through each of those things, safe, easy, and important. Um, why is the 2020 census important? So the census will be determining the number of seats each state has in the House of Representatives in Congress. And it also defines all our districts, like our school districts and voting districts. Um, but most importantly, the census determines the annual allocation of over $675 billion of federal funding every year. That's not for the 10 years, that's every single year. Um, you know, $675 billion is being distributed from Washington, D.C. to states and cities. Um, so we want to make sure we're getting our fair share of those billions and billions of dollars. Um, and, you know, those federal funded programs are things like Medicare and Medicaid, um, Section 8 housing, um, National School Lunch Program. Um, these are things like um, services for seniors, college scholarships. Um, these are really, you know, all these federally funded programs are things that touch all of our lives and touch the lives of our friends and our family. So again, we, we want to make sure that we get our fair share of that funding based on the population count. The 2020 census is safe. Um, so this is really an important point. Um, we are collecting people's information but we will never ever publish your personal information. So um, people can feel safe to fill out the census. Um, we will be you know, publishing the statistics in 2021. Um, we'll, we'll be able to say, you know, this many people live in this neighborhood, this many people live in the city, um, but we will not you know, publish your personal information like your name or, or your phone number or social security number. And all Census Bureau employees are sworn to protect confidentiality for life. Um, so, you know, on our first day at the job, you know, we, 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 we swear by that oath um, to, to, to protect that confidentiality, even if we're only working for the Census Bureau for one year or three months, you know, we're sworn to protect that for life. Um, and I just wanted to mention, you know, the, the Title 13 law that, you know, mandates that we do a census and that protects the information. Um, that's that's the strongest um, privacy law that we have in the United States. So again, it's very, very important to understand that the census is safe and completely confidential. And lastly, responding to the census is easy. 
Um, so we have many different ways for people to reply. They can do it in, you know, whatever ways is best for them. Um, this is the first year that we're inviting uh, respondents to participate online. Um, and um, they can also do it by phone or by paper um, through the questionnaire that was mailed to all households. Um, and I have here a list of what things that we're going to be asking on the census and what we will never ask. So this is very important to differentiate. So for the census, we're going to be asking for every person in your household, the name, age, date of birth, and ethnic background of those individuals. Um, we will never ever ask for your social security number. We will never ask for money or donations or anything on behalf of a political party. And we will never ask for your bank or credit card details. Um, so it's really important to know what we will not be asking for. If you see that in the community, um, you know, there may, unfortunately there, there are people who try to scam other people sometimes. So, you know, please let us know, please report that to the Census Bureau because we wanna make sure that, you know, people are safe. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to mention, we are not asking about uh, the, your citizenship or your legal status in the United States. So again, the census is for all residents. The law is very clear. It says that we have to count all residents. It's not just for citizens of the United States. So it doesn't matter, um, you know, what country you are from or whether you have a green card or a visa. It doesn't matter. We count everyone who happens to be living here on census day, which is April 1st, uh, 2020. So we have a very robust language support program. Um, so we have here listed, these are the 13 languages that um, people can respond to the census in either online or by phone. Um, so we have here Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Russian, Arabic, Tagalog, Polish, French, Haitian, Creole, Portuguese, and Japanese. Um, so again, we wanna make sure that everyone who wants to participate in the census can do so easily. Um, these languages represent more than 99% of U.S. households. Um, so again, we're really trying to make sure that it's accessible um, to everyone. In addition, um, oh, so here are the, the phone numbers uh, for those languages. So if you um, want to, you know, fill out the census um, by phone, um, you can call any of these numbers. Um, and you can speak to somebody um, who, you know, speaks one of these languages and give your information over the phone. In addition, um, we also have um, PDF language guides and video guides in 59 languages total. Um, and those languages are, are listed in this light blue box here. Um, so, you know, we ask that if you know someone who may be has just moved to the United States um, in the last, you know, five or 10 years, um, and maybe English, maybe they speak English, but it's not their first language. Um, we ask that you, you know, share this information with them. We have all our language guides online, as well as on our YouTube channel. Um, so it explains all about the census in these 59 languages. Um, we also have American Sign Language. So, you know, please share that information with people that you know who, who might find this um, useful because it's always great to get information in your, in your native language. I just also wanted to mention that um, a lot of the mailers um, in New York City are, are bilingual, um, English and Spanish. That's fantastic. And I know um, particularly for the immediate community that we're located in at Morris Jumel Mansion, we are in Washington Heights. Um, and so it's a multilingual community and um, these resources are, are really valuable. And we'll also share some of the links to these at the end in our follow-up email as well. So if you're like me and you take notes, there's no need to you know, scribble mm -hmm. them all down. Um, we'll have them for you. Oh, great. That sounds great. Uh, thanks so much. Um, so I just um, quickly wanted to mention about our dates. Um, so the, um, the self-response phase, um, which is when uh, people can respond to the survey online, by phone, or by mail, um, it started in March, on March 12th, 
And originally it was supposed to go until July 31st. Um, but we actually have gotten some, you know, operational adjustments due to COVID-19. So we've asked for a 120 day extension from Congress. Um, so we have a new, uh, you know, schedule. Um, so right now, um, we're, you're, you're, you'll be able to fill out this census, um, again, online, by phone, or through the mail until October 31st, 2020. Um, now, we also have an operation called non-response follow-up, and that's um, basically our door knocking campaign. Um, so typically, if we don't hear from a household, um, we send enumerators or census takers out to conduct the census to households that we haven't heard from yet. Um, so again, usually um, that has also been um, postponed. Um, so that will begin August 11th. Um, so we have just a couple more weeks in June and July um, for people to respond before that door knocking operation begins on August 11th. So um, that's the first part of my presentation. I just wanted to pause and see if we had any questions. Um, yeah, so, um, so let's, just to reiterate, so everyone, um, has the opportunity to respond back to their, um, to complete and return their census by October 31st. So luckily, based on our poll, our sampling of our audience, around 90% of you have already submitted your 2020 census. That is fantastic. Wow. And, go. <laughs> and for the 10% for the of you who haven't yet, there's still time. <laughs> Yes, you have time, but don't wait um, because, right. um, you know, uh, the census is the largest peacetime operation in the United States. It is a huge project yeah. um, and we, we have to hire, you know, half a million people across the country wow. um, to do our non-response follow-up. It's very expensive mm -hmm. and, you know, that's taxpayer money. So, you know, if you can do it online by phone or by mail, that's the best way to do it. And then we don't have to send someone to your door. Um, because, you know, it's very, very expensive. So, you know, please do it before August 11th. And that way we don't come and visit you. <laughs> you can, you can, you can, you know, do the census while safely social distancing online mm -hmm. by phone or by mail. Um, and it looks like based on our webinar chat, we have William who at one point uh, worked on the 2000 census. So I'm curious to know um, if you can respond in the chat, William, uh, were you one of those enumerators that went door to door? Yeah, I, I meet a lot of enumerators um, through my position because um, I'm out I'm usually in the city, not right now, but usually I'm out doing a lot of events out in the city. Mm -hmm. And I meet a lot of enumerators who tell me stories. They say, I, you know, enumerated these huge towers and I knocked on every door you know, in the, these towers. And it's just really interesting um, because, you know, we hire locally. Mm. Um, we always make sure to hire within each census tract. It's even smaller than a zip code. So wow. usually it's, it's people's neighbors who are, you know, you're, you enumerate your own neighborhood. Um, so that's kind of one cool thing about the census is that we hire locally, hyper locally. And, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a part of a community effort to make sure we get a complete and accurate count of our neighborhood. Absolutely. So we've got a response from William. He said that he was in the unit that checked a selection of returns for correctness. Oh, and Daniela um, also wrote that she was a census enumerator in 2000 as well. Fantastic experience, which I have wow. signed on this year. Great. It's like a mini uh, census reunion here. <laughs> um, and oh, and one other thing. Um, Shiloh, one of our moderators, just posted that uh, tonight we're holding a special raffle. Um, if you are able to make a small donation to the mansion during this event, you'll be entered to win a copy of Crossing Broadway, Washington Heights and the Promise of New York City um, by our Manhattan Bureau historian, Rob Schneider. So check out that link on the side panel. And um, going back to responses, Sarah, I'm wondering, you know, how do our audience members and their response to the poll, how do they match up with, 
you know, respondents to the census nationwide in New York City. Could you tell us a little bit more about sure. response rates? So 90% is an amazing response rate. So we are, <laughs> we are way ahead of everyone else, it seems like. So let me just show you a few pictures, um, some screenshots from our response rates that are going on right now. So as of today, um, as of today nationally, um, we have a 61.5% response rate. Mm -hmm. um, so just over six out of 10 households in the US have participated in the census. Um, for New York State, we're a little bit behind that at 56.7%. And then for New York City, we are at 52.1% um, for all of New York City, the five boroughs. So um, we have a response uh, rate map online, and I just took some screenshots here that I can share with you. Um, so I just, um, and you can find that at 2020census.gov. Um, so I just kind of zoomed into the county of Manhattan. Um, so Manhattan is at 53.7% as of today. Um, so, you know, you know, the good news is that more than half of households have responded, um, but we still have a ways to go. Because remember, we want, you know, 100% of our Medicare and Medicaid funded. We want 100% of schools funded. We want 100% of our fire department and, and housing programs and college scholarships. We want 100% of those things. We want to make sure we get 100% count for the census. Um, so um, I took, I also looked a little bit at the area around the mansion. Um, so if I zoom in a little bit more, um, I found that the mansion is located in census tract 243.01. And for that tract, we have a 58.9% uh, response rate. So we're doing pretty well. Excellent. And we have a way to go, <laughs> but we're, we're getting there. And, you know, I just wanted to mention in the 2010 census, Washington Heights had one of the um, highest response rates in New York City. And wow. the great thing, yeah, um, the great thing about that, you know, I think there was a lot of community support. There was a lot of um, local organizations and elected officials who really, you know, worked hard on the census for 2010. And as a result of that, Washington Heights got five more schools. So, you know, it's, again, it, so it matters. Very it important. Really Absolutely. It matters. And it, it really means there's like tangible things that we can get from that, right? Um, so, you know, it's really important that we, we all respond, that we, you know, encourage our neighbors and our family and everyone to respond, um, because it really does make a difference. Um, so I have here the, um, information about, um, this particular census tract. Um, census tracts, um, pr for the most part, they try, we try to keep them stable from, for each census to the next because we wanna be able to compare that data, right? From, for every 10 years. Um, and just, um, I have some information here on the left-hand side um, about some of the demographic information that we have for this census tract. And this information is taking into account the 2010 census data, as well as information from our American Community Survey. And that's a survey that's 140 questions so it's a longer format survey, but it's a survey that's ongoing. So every month of every year, that's going out to about, you know, 1% of the population. Um, so from that information, we can get a picture of a neighborhood um, or of an area. And so as you can see, these are some of the things that we, um, you know, collect information on. Uh, population, it looks like there's about 4,419 people who live in this area. Um, it goes into age distributions. Um, you know, um, ethnic backgrounds, um, how many, what percentage of housing is rented. So, you know, this kind of gives us a picture um, of the neighborhood. So any, any questions about the, the area around the mansion? Meg, do we have any questions? We don't have any questions uh, about the mansion, but William uh, said that he felt that there was a lot of undercounting in Queens. Um, 
Liz actually just asked, do you have a, a percentage for CB12M area? So community board 12? Mm -hmm. Community yes. board 12. So the northern um, part of Inwood. Yeah, so like Inwood um, and Marble mm -hmm. Hill. Um, so there's multiple, um, there's multiple census tracts in that area, um, but it's, it's comparable to Washington Heights. So Washington Heights and Inwood um, are pretty, are responding at a pretty high rate in comparison to the other parts of New York City. Yep. And um, I actually, I actually live uptown. So that's kind of like an area that I'm very interested in and curious about as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I'm just, I am curious to, to know, I mean, what, do you get a sense that COVID is sort of really slowing down the response rate um, at the Census Bureau? Um, well, it's kind of hard to compare because this is the first year uh, the census has been available online. Mm. Um, so, so it's kind of hard to compare to past census. Right. Um, but um, I think it's, it's kind of been difficult in, in some ways because we had to suspend all our field operations. Mm. Um, so I know usually I'm out every day talking to people in different areas, um, doing some, you know, outreach out in the community, out on the street, as they say. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we had to suspend all those field operations. So that was kind of, you know, a challenge. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, we, were, we started doing more virtual events. Um, a lot of our partners and our census partners and community partners started doing uh, text-a-thons and phone banking. Um, and so we, you know, we found so many like creative things in the community that people are doing, you know, sharing the census on social media. And it, in some ways, like, you know, we still have a pretty good um, count. Um, I mean, it's not where we want it to be, but, you know, we're doing pretty well considering the circumstances. Um, so I think we've seen so many creative census partners doing really great outreach work, even though, you know, and in despite of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. That's great. And hopefully, hopefully we'll keep getting those numbers out. And especially yep. with that, that date extension, October 31st, people. Yep. Tell your friends and family. Um, so uh, if we do not have any further questions right now, I think we're just going to switch gears. Um, again, please keep using and sharing in the chat. And I actually have a question for our audience um, that I'm going to post in the chat. Um, if I can. Have any of you used old census records for research? Um, I get a sense that at least one of you, Liz, it sounds like you maybe have done some genealogical research. Ooh. Tell, tell me more. Are there any specific documents that you found to be really helpful? Because this is, this is kind of, uh, ooh, grandparents. Excellent. Um, so as some of you may already know, um, past censuses are also really valuable um, for historical research, particularly when you work at a historic site like Morris Jumel Mansion. Um, so I'm just going to do a, br a brief look um, at a few censuses um, and a few famous individuals who are connected with our site to see, you know, what are some of the things that these documents can tell us about, um, can tell us about the neighborhood, the individuals, and what sort of other questions um, do some of these documents raise as well? Uh, so let me get my PowerPoint up. Can you all see it? All right. Um, so without further ado, we're going to go back into time. Um, so there are three individuals that um, I'm going to focus on this evening who are connected with the mansion um, and see what the census can tell us about them and their lives. The first two are shown here. Um, one is Aaron Burr, whom especially if you are a uh, fan of Hamilton the Musical, know that Mr. Burr um, has quite an infamous reputation as the man who killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel. 
Um, he also was uh, the third vice president of this country as well and served um, in the New York State uh, Assembly among other things. So he's quite an interesting character. Um, the reason why he has a connection to our house, in fact, is due in large part to the other person in this image, Eliza Jumel, who was the longest resident of Morris Jumel Mansion. And in fact, um, after her, hus her first husband, Stephen Jumel, died, in 1833, Eliza married Aaron Burr, uh, who's many years her senior. They got married in the French parlor uh, in the mansion. And it was a very short-lived affair in that Mr. Burr only lived on site for a matter of months before Eliza started proceedings to divorce him. So... There's more of a story there, but getting into the census and what the census can tell us. Uh, Aaron Burr was in fact uh, a participant in the very first federal census under the Washington administration. So you can see a little snapshot here uh, and you can see, you know, in marked contrast to what Sarah was telling us about, you know, the census today and some of the questions that are asked, this was very, very basic. Um, you can see at the top that the census enumerator was focusing on the South Ward of New York City and that there were only six questions that were asked at the time. So starting on the left, um, you see a column. The only names that are on here are the, the names of the heads of households. Um, and then the others are enumerations, counting, literally head counting, the number of individuals that fall into these other categories. So we can see um, there's quite a focus on quote unquote free white males of various ages, 16 and over and um, under the age of 16. We can also see a little bit, it gives us a snapshot of uh, counting quote unquote free white females in households. Um, apparently their ages are not as important to the census enumerator at this time or the government. Then we have these other two categories, which again, give us a window into the past here. There's a category described as all other free persons which is intriguing. Perhaps they are talking about emancipated enslaved people, maybe indentured servants. Um, and then uh, the last column is labeled slaves. So enslavement was um, a, woven into the fabric of the founding of this country and in many um, government documents at that time. And if we go to the next slide, we can see that we can see Aaron Burr is listed as the head of household in this very early census, um, second from the bottom. And, you know, again, we got a little bit of a, a tantalizing snapshot of, of him and placing him in context with his neighbors. Um, so while he um, is among many men who are the heads of household. If you look closely, there's actually a fair amount of women's names also as heads of households, which is very intriguing. You can also see that, um, you know, he does have, there are some children and some women in the household. Um, probably one of the women is his daughter, Theodosia. And he also is an enslaver, like many of his contemporaries at this time. Um, so again, it was very much a fact of life and thinking of, you know, why the government would want to do a head count of everyone, including people who, who were considered to be property. A lot of that still gets back to some of those same questions of political representation and taxation and other things. So um, we're going to see how what the what the government, the information it wants to collect is going to change markedly um, when we sort of switch gears, we leave Aaron Burr behind. We could 
do a whole presentation on him and focus on um, Eliza Bowen Jumel Burr. Um, now, perhaps some of you who have done research, uh, genealogical research, already knows about the treasure trove that is the state census. Um, and in fact, the New York State Census um, was conducted uh, every 10 years from 1825 to 1925. And what's really great about this, as the nerdy historian that I am, is that it happens to fall in between the federal census. So you can get more of an update and a snapshot of how people's households, their neighborhoods, you know, professions, things are changing by looking at these documents together. Um, so let's see what it has to tell us about uh, Eliza Jumel. So if we take a look here, we can see again, this is the New York State Census. And so again, it's a, it's a marked contrast to what Sarah was showing us with the neighborhood as it is today in Washington Heights. Back then, it was still more rural. And you can see that in fact, um, Eliza Jumel, we would probably call her a member of the 1% today because um, she is the head of household. Her household is evaluated at um, $150,000 and which is a lot back then. Yeah, I see Sarah's expression. And not only that, but look at the number of people who are listed in her household. Counting her, there are 14 people. Now that is, and most of those are hired help. Um, there's only a few family members. She's got two nephews and a niece living with her, but look at the whole list of quote unquote help. That's how they're designated. Coming from places like Ireland and Scotland, so if you kind of peel back the layers too, you know, this also gives us a snapshot into immigration patterns in the country at this time. Um, you can also see that the information being collected is uh, as expanded. We've got, you know, a list of occupations. Um, moving towards the right, we have voters, um, whether they're born here or naturalized citizens. And then we even have, um, a column to the far right that um, uses some very, what we would consider unpolitically correct terminology, probably to assess the, um, the number of the population that have mental illnesses of some sort. So thinking about, you know, why would the government want that information too? Well, you know, if any of us have heard the term public charge, and the responsibility for setting up facilities to take care of people who, who can't look after themselves, you know, this is another reason perhaps for finding out that uh, information. Uh, so keep this in mind. Oh, and lastly, you can also see where everyone was born. You can see that Eliza was born in Rhode Island. And lastly, she dropped her surname of Burr pretty quickly, at least on this document, right? She's listed as Jumel. Um, so I'm curious, uh, before I move on, does anyone have any questions from the audience or observations? Um, Liz just asked about the last slide. Um, is idiotic a category or did, did that mean something else then? Yeah, that is a really great question. Um, I, I remember people asking this when I worked at the Tenement Museum as well. Um, I don't know exactly the, the differentiation in classification, but I, um, that is something that I would be curious to find out with, with research. But I think the general point is well taken in that this is sort of assessing people who will need um, institutional facilities and the funding that goes with that. But that's a great question. Um, and as many of you probably know too, it's always the census and other government records are a starting point in your research. You always wanna verify and use other sources to make sure the information is correct. 
because uh, if you take a look at Eliza Jumel and the 1860 census, you can see that there are some discrepancies and also some big changes. So I'm curious to know um, what are some of your observations from the audience? And this is a snapshot of her entire household. So that's the first major change, right? So we've got her. Her household has been cut in half within five years. So that's a question. Um, and if you also look to the far right, that column lists where people were born. And for some intriguing reason, Eliza has said that she was born in France. <laughs> so five years ago, Rhode Island. Five years later, France. So again, it's really intriguing and it begs a lot of questions, but you know, if, if we tend to think about you know, what could have caused that, maybe human error in the recording of it, um, maybe a little artistic license by Eliza, maybe like many people when they're asked to give their exact age, they fabricate a little bit. So again, you know, very, very human things to do that impact this document. And then lastly, I want to make sure we have time for questions. So I just want to briefly touch on the third famous person who's associated with the history of the mansion um, in the 20th century, actor and activist Paul Robeson. Um, and I've posted a quote here. He actually lived in a variety of places surrounding the mansion. And um, while he was living on Sylvan Terrace across the street, um, in this quote, he talks about looking out his window and um, seeing the mansion and how that um, sparked a reflection on his ancestors who came to this country as enslaved people, but who were essential in the building of America, and also reflecting, I'm sure, on how far he has come since then as an internationally famous movie star. Um, so if we take a look at 1940, it's even more in intriguing. Mr. Robeson and his family, his wife, his mother-in-law, and his son were all living in an apartment building on Edgecombe Avenue that's still there today, 555, also referred to as the Triple Nickel. Um, and this building between the 1920s throughout the 1940s was really a hive of activity and uh, was a place where some of the famous artists and intelligentsia from the Harlem Renaissance lived and worked. Um, so we can see here, again, on this federal census, the categories are, um, there's many, many more categories, um, which again is a treasure trove for historians. Um, and we can see also it gives us a snapshot not only of the Robeson family, um, but also an indication of the neighborhood and other types of information that's being collected. So we can see at the top, we have Paul Robeson and his wife, Islanda. And some of the information is the same that's being collected, right? Um, but there's also shifting categories in terms of asking about the level of education. If you see in number 13 and 14, um, there, there are college educated, C4 stands for college educated, completion of four years. Um, you can also see number 10, there's still that issue of uh, the categorizing based on race. So you can see everyone listed in this, this column as the abbreviation NEG, which is short for Negro, an antiquated term for African Americans. And if you continue looking at the same document, these are all people who are living in this building at this time. So you can see 
that at the very top, you know, Mr. Robeson is a famous singer. His industry is opera, which is very cool. And you can see that he is one of many performers living in this building. There's at least four or five other singers. We can also see that there's sort of a smattering of, you know, respectably middle class work as a typist, an information clerk, photographers. Um, and again, this is a, a great snapshot of this time of this neighborhood in the middle of the Harlem Renaissance um, with a, a growing African-American middle and upper class and arts community. So again, these are just a few of the things that you can find out. This is part of why I love the census. Um, and uh, here's a few places to start if you are intrigued. So I would love to open this up to more general discussion. So you can share your comments and your questions either in the chat or by raising your hand. Okay, let me see if I can. There we go. Sarah, we had a question for you earlier. I know you said that you live uptown, so you mm -hmm. uh, focus a bit up there, but we did have a question um, about the rate in Murray Hill, Manhattan, and it was from Anonymous. So I don't know who asked that, but wondering mm -hmm. if you have any info about the Murray Hill area. Um, not if I, not, I didn't look it up today, um, mm -hmm. but I can um, look that up um, later and send it if you'd like, and we can uh, give it as a resource. So the numbers are changing every single day. So, and there's like hundreds of census tracts in Manhattan. So I can't keep up with every single neighborhood. Um, but remember that census tracts are usually, um, usually one neighborhood is multiple census tracts. So um, um, I can look that up later or send you guys the response rate map and you can, you know, follow that. Um, so um, there's probably like uh, maybe five or six um, census tracts that that area is a part of. Um, but in general, um, Manhattan is doing um, a little bit better than the, the New York City um, average. Um, but there are parts of Manhattan that um, I think due to COVID-19, a lot of people left the city. Um, so there's some areas that, um, you know, people weren't uh, filling out their census um, near um, Central Park um, and a little like south east of um, Central Park, there was um, some low response rate in that area, probably because a lot of people um, starting in March when the self response period became available, they left New York. Um, so there are some um, still some areas in Manhattan with very low response rates that we're, we're working to um, get higher. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're looking at, if we're interested in looking at specific response rates, is there a way to do that while the census is live? Yeah, so you can go to 2020census.gov and in the search bar, um, check response rate map. Um, and there we have, we show every census tract um, and oh, you can look up different cities, states, um, counties, um, you know, congressional districts. Um, so you can check um, where you live or your neighborhood um, and you can, that gets updated every day, um, every weekday. Um, so five times a week that's updated um, and we're following that very closely. But, you know, of course the public can um, check that out on our response rate map. It's, you know, publicly available information. Um, so anyone can go on there and check um, the response rates for their area. Great. You. Um, and just to let everyone know, we did find an answer to that question yes. about the phrasing on the census. I see so that. If you are interested in learning more, you are more than welcome uh, to click, but I'll read you a little quote. Um, enumerators and, and our past enumerators might be interested in this too. Um, enumerators were given a specific definition for a person who was uh, blind, deaf, or dumb, um, or a specific definition for the term idiot. An idiot was a person with developmental uh, 
person whose development or mental fac faculties were arrested. Um, so this would mean someone more likely um, translated today, someone with Down syndrome or, or maybe on the spectrum. Um, so while it does seem like a very insensitive phrase today, um, that, that would have just been the category back then. Um, and I, I think that's another way that, that shows uh, how the census progresses. Absolutely. Along with our population. Mm -hmm. Census, yes, ideas mean, about medicine, different communities. Yeah. And we know that, um, you know, that the census is also really important for people with disabilities because we know that about one in five Americans has either a physical or mental disability. Um, so, you know, it's really important that we have the resources um, available for um, people to live independently and to have the, you know, the right uh, treatment or support programs in place. Um, so again, you know, having that total count, even though we don't ask about a disability on the 2020 census, we do have uh, questions on um, that on our larger survey with the American Community Survey that I mentioned, the 140 question survey. Um, so again, that's very important um, for us to know um, so that we can, you know, put programs um, towards those um, programs. Okay, so I can also see in the chat that census data is also useful for Louise, as well as for us at the mansion as part of writing grants and proving our museum does programming that benefits the community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and we also have an update on our uh, Crossing Broadway raffle winner, uh, Margaret Frick, come on down virtually. Um, you are the, the winner of the book. Um, so thank you so much to all of you who um, submitted a donation to the mansion. And uh, we will correspond with you and figure out the best way to get your uh, prize book to you. Ah, okay. Uh, any other questions, comments, or thoughts about the census? Hopefully, all of you, if you weren't enthusiastic about the census as a document before, either in the present or past, um, have a new appreciation for it, and we've sparked your curiosity. And, um, I would just like to thank everyone for joining us this evening, both on Zoom and via the live stream. And thank you so much, Sarah, for coming here tonight and sharing your expertise with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was so fun. I just, that information you presented was so interesting. And, you know, maybe one day somebody will look back on the 2020 census and as a, as a historical period and see what, you know, what our neighborhoods look like and what you know what we were doing absolutely um, so i just wanted to um uh, thank you for having me and just you know remind everyone that even if you've already filled out your census please uh help a family member or an elderly neighbor or someone you know who maybe english isn't their first language let's try to make sure that we get a complete and accurate count for the 2020 census Wonderful. Um, thank you all so much. And um, we hope that um, some of you will be able to join us next month for our topic. Um, it's going to be another women's history topic uh, about Eliza Jumel, uh, who was mentioned, of course, and another Eliza, uh, Eliza Greaterex, an artist. So we are going to have um, an art historian, Professor Manthorne, speak a little bit about her, the connection between those two women. And I will also be following up with you. Look for an email from us with a brief survey and a link to some of those great additional resources we spoke about. Great. Great. Thank you all. Have a great evening.